to kind of offer some ways to think about the core this morning um, in that space. So first of all, I think we can look at the way we can frame our, our, our work with the core. One thing that we can do is recognize that sometimes we have to frame it in just observation. So one of the first things that we do is we have to read it, right? And we have to kind of read it without blinders. We have to kind of step back a little bit and be objective about it, be able to kind of read it with fresh eyes, put on a new set of glasses and be able to look at it. And once we've done that, I think we're ready for a different kind of frame. I think we're ready to start to contextualize what it means. We're ready to start thinking about, well, what do these standards mean in the context of our school, in the context of my classroom, in the context of my individual students? And once we're able to kind of start contextualizing, I think we're ready for a third kind of frame, and that's the kind of frame that requires us to, de to design and to build. And when we get to this stage, I think what we're able to do is we're able to start thinking about how to design the kinds of learning experiences that are going to be both aligned and, and um, a component of the core, as well as really meaningful. I think in order to do this, we have to start with some fundamental knowledge. So just here are a few patterns that we have seen in the Common Core State Standards um, that kind of stand out as a little bit different, a little bit nuanced, maybe something um, that we haven't always seen before. First of all, I'm sure that you know that there is a lot of nonfiction that is included in the Common Core. There's a call for nonfiction. There is a call for argument instead of persuasion. and in that sense, we're looking at the difference between making an argument based on logic and using emotion to help fuel that logic versus being persuasive on emotion alone. The third thing that we find is that there is a call for integration. The way to make this core come alive, the way to make it make sense in a classroom, is to make sure that we do not teach strands of literacy discreetly. We want to weave together reading and writing and viewing and speaking and, speaking and listening and, and language skills. All of those need to be integrated together. We also find that even at second grade, students have to start seeing texts in conversation with each other. Texts can no longer be in isolation. So one of the things that the core is, is telling us is that it's not enough to read the book, take the quiz, take the test, and have kids think that they're done with the book. Instead, what we do is we read a text, we juxtapose it with other texts, we make sure that these texts are in conversation with other things that we're reading in the course, that things are no longer in isolation. We also know that the core is calling for a new kind of text complexity, which is really wonderful, and I think it actually really takes into consideration um, a lot of facets that we value. But probably most importantly, what we see out of this, this strand of the core is that literacy is our collective responsibility. It is the responsibility of all teachers. It is the responsibility of all teachers in all disciplines. Because, you know, if we want students to be passionate about writing and about reading, what do we as teachers need to do first? We have to be readers first. We have to be writers first. If we want students to be historians, then we have to treat them like historians. If we want them to be mathematicians, we have to treat them like mathematicians. And that means that we all have to embrace the literacy of our disciplines. And that's part of what this core is, is calling for. So once we kind of have this knowledge and we kind of come to this understanding, I certainly think our experience is valuable. And we have to remember that it is our experience that's going to help guide us um, through this process. And certainly that we find communities. We cannot do it alone. We cannot progress in isolation. So whether it is opening up the classroom, your classroom door and talking to the person next to you, whether it is working in teams of teachers in your buildings or districts or coming to conferences like this, we need to find ways to work together. Because I think oftentimes what we do in isolation is we end up relying on things. So often we look at, at, at a document like the Common Core and we think it's a list of things to do. 
And the truth is that it's not. It is a map for learning. And we have to make sure that we understand the difference between those two. Because it is the process of learning that is certainly the most important. And I think when we kind of shift our minds from tasks to learning, we're going to see a shift in some of the things we ask students to do. We're going to see assignments that are now experiences. We're going to be, we're going to see texts that are now conversations. We're going to see questions that are now catalysts. And that's part of the shift. It's part of the shift from task to learning, right? And this is so much about what Linda Darling Hammond spoke about this morning, right? The difference between rote and rich, open-ended opportunities for our students. I think that so often uh, the bridge that's going to help us make that journey from task to learning is going to require a little gentle failure, right? It's going to require a little gentle failure on our part and a little gentle failure on the part of our students. Because, you know, I have students who come into my class, I'm sure you all do too, and, and sometimes they get really frustrated if they can't do it right the first time. Does this happen to anybody? Yes. They get really frustrated if they can't do it right the first time. And, you know, in these moments, I realize that my most important job as a teacher is not to make the anxiety go away. My most important job as a teacher is to sit beside them as they figure it out for themselves, right? To ask them the questions, to lead them to constructing their own knowledge and their own understanding. And one of the ways that I think we do this is we have to own some dispositions. We have to be not just the teachers in our classrooms. I think classrooms need to be places where everybody is elevated to the status of learner. That that hierarchy between teacher and student is collapsed and it's flattened. And when we flatten that hierarchy, we all get to be a learner. And one of the best dispositions, one of the best gifts we can give our students is to be an intellectual risk taker. My uh, grandfather actually taught me a lot about intellectual risk taking years ago, although he had no idea that that's what he was doing. Um, I'm the oldest of all the grandchildren on my mother's side, and uh, for 30 years, we went to uh, a lake in Minnesota, all my aunts and uncles and cousins. When I was about 10, my grandfather bought a speedboat. Now, my grandfather had wanted to buy a speedboat for his own, for his own children so he could teach them how to water ski, but he couldn't afford it. Well, he could finally afford it by the time he had grandkids, and since I was the oldest, he said, you know, Sarah, we have this boat, and I have these skis. I think you need to learn how to water ski and teach everybody else that it's nothing to be afraid of. And yeah, I'm pretty dutiful. I'm pretty dutiful. So I said, okay, Grandpa, I will do it. So I, that summer, I figured out. I figured out how to get up out of the water on the skis. I could go all the way around the lake without, you know, letting or without um, wiping out. And I was really proud of myself. Uh, and then my grandpa said, you know, Sarah, that's really nice, but you're not done. And I said, what are you talking about, Grandpa? I got up. I went around the lake. I let go. I didn't even get my hair wet. What are you talking about? And he said, well, you have to go outside the wake. I said, I'm not going outside the wake. <laughs> Do you all know what the wake is? When you're, when you're, stand, when you're behind the boat, there, you know, it looks like a tidal wave when you're 10. And the only thing I could think about when my grandpa said you need to go outside the wake is if I try to go over that big white cap, that my ski is going to fly off and go up my nose or something horrible. So I said, Grandpa, I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm not going to go outside the wake. I said, I like it behind the boat. When I am behind the boat, you know, all I have to do is hang on. And I said, and, and you know, the, everything it just is in a straight row, and I really like it. And he said, Sarah, you're never going to have a real ride until you get outside the wake. So I refused to do it that year, but the next year, he was not going to let me off the hook. And he picked this beautiful night. Um, the water was like glass. Out we went. And I know my grandfather well enough to know that he would just go around in a circle as long as it took for me to go outside the wake. So I kind of gathered up my courage, right? And I decided, okay, I'm just going to go for it. So off I go. Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that the anxiety I had built up about going outside the wake for a year at that point was far worse than actually doing it. Um, but so I get outside the wake, and you know, my grandpa was right, and my grandpa's right most of the time. It was beautiful, and it really was this wonderful ride, and I will tell you why. It's because it was my ride, and that boat was not pulling me. I was in charge of myself. 
when I think about what it means to be an intellectual risk taker, it means helping our students to understand the difference between letting a boat pull them through and figuring out how to get outside that wake and make sense of it themselves. But we have to be willing to do it first, right? And we have to be willing to do it in their presence. I think that so often we have this myth about the delivery of curriculum. That we think um, if we deliver the thing, right? If we deliver it, if, if, if I give them this task and then this one and then this one, everything is going to work out just perfectly. But I think, that, I think that's it. I think it's a myth. Because in this notion of, of delivery, we forget that we have a teacher, right? And we don't need prepackaged things. We need teachers who are willing to be risk takers. We need teachers who are willing to think alongside their students, to ask questions alongside their students, to be writers first, to be readers first, to be thinkers first, so that they can open up that world to them. If you came into my classroom, um, I think you would maybe see what the difference between delivery and teaching looks like. And sometimes we don't always understand the difference between the two. So um, if you came into my classroom, you know, you certainly could see me doing something like this, standing in front and, you know, talking to kids and, um, you know, offering this is what we're going to do. But I will tell you what you just saw there was Sarah Wessling giving directions. That wasn't Sarah Wessling teaching. Sarah Wessling teaching looks a lot more like this. It looks a lot more like me sitting next to the students. It looks like me doing podcasts of, um, about the, in response to the things that they write. It looks like me answering the emails that they send at 2 o'clock in the morning because you know how teenagers sleep. It's different, right? There is a difference between giving directions and teaching. And what this, what this core is going to ask us to do is to understand that difference. If you came into my room, not only would you see that my desk is in the back of the classroom, but you would see that I have this small print of a Jackson Pollock in there, and I love my Jackson Pollock. And I especially love my Jackson Pollock because I constantly feel like I'm in the middle of one, like my room is that kind of chaotic place. Um, but I always wait for the day when inevitably one of my students will say, you know, I could be famous too. All I'd have to do is take a bucket of paint and throw it on a canvas. I could be famous and rich, right? It always ends in and rich. And this is my opportunity, right? Because this is my opportunity to tell them that Jackson Pollock's brilliance, his genius, was in his process, right? Because he reimagined process. And it was through his process that he created this art. So when we think about classrooms, I think we need to remember that what may appear chaotic is deliberate, precise, and carefully designed. It doesn't have to come in a pre-packaged box for it to be art. My daughter taught me a lot about the difference between real learning and kind of fake learning. She asked me a while ago if I would like to play school with her. And I will tell you that when she asked me this this afternoon, this one afternoon, I had been really waiting for my daughter to ask me to play school with her, right? So I said, yes, Lauren, I would love to play school with you. I said, how do we play school? She said, well, you can be the teacher and I can be the student. And I said, well, I, th I can be the teacher. I said, but what does the teacher do? She said, well, you can give me something to work on and I'll go back to my desk and I'll, I'll work on it and then I'll bring it back to you and you can tell me if I did a good job. And then you can give me something else to do and I'll go sit at my desk and I'll work on it and I'll bring it back to you and you can tell me if I did a good job. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I have got the cutest little, you know, cutest little girl ever. Until about 10 seconds later when I was completely mortified because I wondered, is this what my daughter thinks I do all day? Does she think that I hand out papers and pick them up and tell kids that they are good or bad or right or wrong? That is playing the game of school. It is not teaching. When we think about the task in front of us, we have to remember that our job is not to play the game of school. This core is asking us to be teachers. It's it's giving us an opportunity to empower ourselves to be teachers. 
When we think about that game of school, and if oftentimes it means more factories, right? We cannot afford one more factory. We are tired of 20th century factory models of education. If we want 21st century models of schools where we value innovation and collaboration and creativity and ingenuity, we need to make sure that we are not playing that game because we know that it takes time to grow learners and that achievement and enlightenment are not the same thing. I think in this country we have a paradox of achievement. I think as long as we keep talking about achievement the way that we have been, we are never going to get there because we're talking about the wrong things, right? So I took this photograph when I was, um, can we get, put the slide back up? Yeah, there we go. So I took this photograph when I was in Boston. Does anyone know where this, uh, where I took this photograph? Uh, close, very close. I heard MIT. This is the entrance of Harvard. When you walk into Harvard and you look up, it says enter to grow in wisdom. It does not say enter to grow in achievement. It does not say enter to score well on a standardized test. It says, enter to grow in wisdom. And we can do it, right? We can do this. I think that we also assume that accountability creates urgency. And I think that's, that's what people outside of education want from us. They want us to, to feel urgent about our work, as though we don't feel urgent about our work. But they want us to feel urgent about our work. And they think that if we place more accountability on our teachers, we will increase that sense of urgency. But I don't think that's true. You know what I think creates urgency? I think collaboration creates urgency. I think fighting isolation creates urgency. I think when we get outside of our classrooms and outside of our schools and outside of our states and outside of our country, we will have a different sense of urgency. When we, when we don't rely on that, on that collaboration, we end up stacking things. I think we, we put things in compartment, in discrete boxes and places. So when you look at that core and you start to read it and you see those anchor standards and then you see, and you see the, the, the descriptors of what those look like, you could easily start to think, all right, there are 10 of these. That means I'm going to do 10 assignments, right? One assignment per descriptor. That's not what this is about, right? Because that keeps them isolated. It keeps them discreet. That doesn't create those rich environments for our students to be thinkers. Instead, I think we need to look at the places where overlap occurs. And when we look at those places, we kind of see a layering. And I think that's where our design work can come in. 